الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلوات الله وسلامه على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه ومن اهتدى بهداه الى يوم الدين اما بعد dear brothers and sisters this night we're going to speak about how did the maliki school start and what are the main books that it stands on and this is a very interesting topic that every students that is interested in the maliki school has to uh, take care of when we speak about madhab madhab means it comes it's derived from the word dhahaba dhahaba that means he went so when you say madhab that means the roots that you chose and uh, when we speak about madhab it means the way that you chose to follow no matter it's uh, in your belief or in your daily daily actions and we're speaking about uh, in uh, we're speaking about a religious uh, point of view so you can speak about a madhab out of religion which is a type of ideology and you can speak about a madhab religiously which can be a creed like all types of religions and beliefs and stuff like that or you can speak about a madhab in your life where you follow a law a type of law or a jurisprudence this law might be a secular law or might be a religious law and the religious law is either islam or other types of religions and every religion has uh types has roots inside it now islam in the beginning was revealed to our beloved prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and then his his students which are his companions the sahaba radiyallahu anhum uh learned from the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and from what he re- he recited for, for for them from the quran and from his teachings which were later on compiled in books that we know that, that the that we know which are the books that were compiled by you know bukhari muslim etc yes the first book that was compiled the first book that compiled the sayings of our beloved prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is al muwatta by imam malik rahimahullah now there were a lots of or several students from the companions several students of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam from his companions which were knowledgeable and were more than others in in understanding the teachings of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and that started teaching others we can find amongst these the older sahaba like abu bakr and umar and uthman and ali and others and we can find the minor sahaba that were uh, in the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's day still young like abdullah ibn umar ibn khattab like abdullah ibn abbas like abdullah ibn zubair like others so these are considered as minor sahab these sahaba spread in the world or actually in that world in the old world so some of them went to al basra some of them went to kufa in iraq some of them went to syria damascus and or aleppo or or whatever and some of them went to egypt and some of them remained in medina or went to mecca or something like that these sahaba started giving their teachings and started teaching people how they understood from the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and then they faced new problems that didn't exist in the days of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam so they had in their minds a way of thinking 
that they implemented it and they started deriving new laws from what they had in their minds. And this led to two main schools. The school that was in Hijaz, which was mostly the school of Hadith, and the school that was in Iraq, which was mainly the school of opinion, Madrasatul Ra'i, and the other one, Madrasatul Hadith. The school of Hijaz depended a lot on the text, where the school of Iraq depended on logic and uh, rational uh, opinions. So these two main schools had conflict between them, and I'm speaking about the days after the Prophet and after the Sahaba, which we had the students of the Sahaba, which we call them at tabiun So therefore, we're speaking about the students of the Sahaba, which are the Tabi'een, and the word Tabi' means a follower. And uh, we had in every city from these cities that I just mentioned right now, a lots of these Tabi'oon that followed these uh, uh, Sahaba and started spreading their knowledge and their teachings. So the main Imam that was in Hijaz was Imam Malik, rahimahullah. And the main Imam that was in Iraq was an Imam Sufyan al-Thawri and, and was an Imam Abu Hanifa. And the main Imam that was in Syria was an Imam al-Awza'i. And the main Imam that was in Egypt was al-Layth ibn Sa'd. So therefore we had these main Imams. And they were... Uh, they were sometimes more closer to the, the school of Hadith, and sometimes they were close to the school of uh, opinion and rational thinkings. Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah, inherited the school of Kufa in Iraq, and Imam Malik rahimahullah, inherited the school of Medina and Hijaz. And both of them had great students. And Imam Malik rahimahullah, depended on the fatwas of the scholars of Medina especially. And he said that Medina was the capital of Islam and Medina had the greatest Sahaba in it. And Umar radiallahu anhu uh, forbid anybody to go out of Medina except with his permission so few sahaba went out of medina so therefore he depended on the actions of the scholars of medina and he considered that as a type of sunnah that's why they call this madhab madhab ahl medina the school of medina the school goes back to main sahaba that are umar radiallahu anhu rithman aisha radiallahu anha and then Abdullah ibn Umar ibn Khattab. Abdullah ibn Umar ibn Khattab, he is the main uh, Sahabi that Imam Malik depends on. Where the school of Kufa depended on the, st the, the, the teachings of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, which was sent by Umar to Kufa, and then by Ali ibn Abi Talib, عنه, who, was sent, who, who remained there and made his capital in Kufa. Uh, the school of Kufa later on was inherited by Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, which was a great uh, Imam, knowledgeable Imam, and had a lot of students that spread in the world. And his school later on became the greatest school that we can say the majority of Muslims nowadays follow that school. Because all Turks, no matter they are in Turkey or in Turkestan, or in uh, the Muslims of China, or India, the Indies, uh, all the Indian subcontinents, subcontinents, and uh, lots of Muslims, uh, Sunni Muslims, 
in Iran, like the Blushes and others, all these guys are in Afghanistan and all these are Hanif. So all these were uh, Hanif. Even the Muslims of, of Russia and North uh, and uh, uh, Eastern Europe that were under the authority of the, the Ottoman Empire, all these were Hanafis. Now, Imam Malik, rahimahullah, had a student, a, a very clever and, uh, and uh, knowledgeable student, smart student. His name was Muhammad bin Idris Shafi. He was originally from uh, Mecca, and uh, he came to Imam Malik, he studied, he took knowledge from him, and then he went to Iraq, and then he went to Egypt. So he mixed, and he studied uh, with the students of Imam uh, Abu Hanifa, like Muhammad bin Hassan al-Shayban. So he decided that you can't follow a school, a specific school in a city. No. He said, we have to follow the hadith. We have to follow the hadith. So he wrote his book in Usul al-Fiqh, which is called al risala and he supported that we have to follow the hadith and we're not supposed to say our opinion or our rational uh, um, uh, statements when we have a hadith. hadith. When the hadith comes, that's it. And don't say that we follow the actions of Medina or Kufa or whatever. No. We have to follow the hadith because the Prophet Sallallahu companions spread in the world. So they, you can't say that they were only in one city. This teaching spread in Iraq and it had a lot of supporters. And from the main supporters that were uh, known in Iraq, uh, Imam Ahmad ibn Muhammad, rahimahullah, which was one of the most smartest and pious students of Imam Shafi, rahimahullah. And then Imam Shafi went to Egypt and he spread his teachings there. So he made his own school. And he criticized several uh, opinions of, uh, not opinions actually, several statements of his uh, Shaykh Imam Malik. So therefore, we had four uh, schools now. They weren't four schools. They were more than that. I told you that Imam Awza'i was in, Egypt, in, in Syria. The Imam Layth ibn Sa'id was in Egypt. And then we had a lot of other scholars, like we have Sufyan Thodi in, in, in Kufa. But later on, these schools started to uh, merge until we had only these four schools. Although the Imam Ahmad's school was or, uh, actually part of Imam Shafi'i's school. In the beginning, they didn't use to split them from each other. They were one school. But later on, there, there it was uh, because Imam Ahmad was so uh, famous when he st stood uh, besides the 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 the, uh, the, the Mu'tazilites and all, all these uh, uh, people who were against the Sunnah. So and he was tortured and he w was put in prison. So many of his students started getting influenced by his opinions, even his, uh, his, his uh, uh, ideas in fiqh and so and so, although he, did, he didn't like that, but later on he became a, a, a specific school. Now let us go back to Medina. Imam Malik, rahimahullah, had a very strong personality. They used to say that Imam Malik, rahimahullah, is, was like a king. And then when he sits down, when he sits down, okay, I, I didn't tell you that there were other schools that are similar to these schools, like the school of uh, the, the Prophet Sallallahu descendants, like the school of Ja'far al-Sadiq, and like the school of Imam Zayd ibn Ali, which was very similar and close to the school of Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah. And when you read the books of the Zaydis, you find it very similar to the Hanafis. And when, because it was in Kufa and because it, got, it derives from Ali ibn Abi Talib, so it was similar to it. The school of uh, Ja'far al-Sadiq, which was the professor of Imam Malik, was in Medina, 
So it's similar to the Medini school in, in general, but uh, we can say that the, the Shia stole the school and then they added to it a lots of innovations. So that's why people did consider it from the official schools. So therefore, nowadays, there are other schools, actually. Uh, but these are called the Sunni schools, and the others are called Shi'i schools, like the Zaydis. We have the Zaydis, the Zaydis in Yemen, and we have the Ja'faris, who are the, the Shia of Iran and, and Syria and so on. And we have uh, the Ibadis, who are actually a part of the Khawarij, and they are in Oman, and some uh, and some of them are in Algeria and Tunisia and uh, Libya. But there are only few people who follow that school. So therefore, this, the, the, let's go back to the Maliki school, where the Imam Malik rahimahullah had, had a very strong personality, and he started teaching. And the main book that he wrote with his hand, and he taught a long time in the Prophet Sallallahu Masjid, Masjid al-Nabawi, was al muwatta So therefore, the first book that Imam Malik, rahimahullah, wrote, and he, he wrote it by compiling the knowledge of Medina, is al muwatta So there, al muwatta was the main book that Imam Malik wrote, and it has a lots of narrations but the most the famous one is Muatta Yahya ibn Yahya al-Layfi Yahya ibn Yahya is uh, from Cordoba he's originally from Morocco from Tangier and he's a Berber uh, scholar he went when he was 25 years old to Medina and he studied uh, Muatta with Imam Malik and then he came back to Andalusia in Cordoba and he spread his knowledge. He was a very famous and pious person. There are other Muatta's that a lot of them were published nowadays, like Muatta uh, Abi Mus'ab al-Zuhri, who was, the, this, uh, who was uh, the successor of Imam Malik in uh, teaching in Medina. Abu Mus'ab al-Zuhri is from the descendants of uh, Abdurrahman ibn Awf, uh, one of the ten uh, promised uh, sahaba to go to paradise. Abd al-Rahman al-Rauf is very famous. And he was a judge in Medina and he wrote his Muatta. His Muatta is the biggest Muatta. He has maybe 100 narrations more than Muatta Ibn Yahya And we have other Muattas that were published nowadays. But when you say Muatta, it goes back always to Muatta Yahya Ibn Yahya al -Layfi. And people took care of that book and started narrating it and spreading it. And the people of the Western part of uh, Islamic states used to go to Medina to Hajj and visit Medina and then go to the Imam Malik. So they didn't need to go to somewhere else. That's why the, this school spread in all of Africa, not only in uh, Northern Africa, all Africa uh, were, were Malikis, and even Andalusia and Sicily and all the islands that were conquered by Muslims in the Mediterranean, and even South Italy, uh, South Italy and uh, even South France. All these lands, when they were Muslim, they were Malikis. Um, the, the, Maliki, the, the, the Malikis took care of the Muatta, but the Muatta actually has only 2,000 narrations in it. 600 are the sayings of the Prophet Wasallam, and the others are Sahaba, Tabi'un, and sayings of Imams of Medina, and opinions of Imam Malik himself. So the Muatta is not like the Bukhari, only the sayings of the Prophet Wasallam. It's a a compiled book that has all these things in it. 600 narrations of the Prophet ﷺ, and the others are from the Sahaba, Tabi'un, and Imams of Medina, and 
äh, saying soll immer make himself. So this was the main book of the Madhab. And the Madhab spread quickly in Northern Africa. And from North Africa, it went to Andalusia because uh, Andalusia was conquered uh, early by Muslims. And uh, lots of Muslims from uh, Syria, from Iran, from Egypt, from uh, Arabia went to, the, to uh, Andalusia. And from North Africa, the Madhab spread to uh, the central of Africa, and all Africans later on became Malikis. Except the Malikis are in all Africa, except in uh, the uh, Abyssinia, Eritrea, and uh, Somalia, and Kenya. These are Shafi'is. These are Shafi'is. Or else all Africans are, yes, Ma Egypt has the four Madhab. Egypt in the beginning was for the Imam Malik. And then when Imam Shafi entered Egypt, he spread his school and he had a lot of students there. And later on, some students of the Hanafis came to Egypt, so they spread, and especially after the uh, Ottoman Empire took place, it, uh, its official Madhab was the, 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 the Hanafi. Even the Abbasi, uh, the Abbasi dynasty was uh, was Hanafi, so the the Madhab spread and it spread even in North Africa, and it was in a, a little bit in Tunisia and Algeria as well. But nowadays, I think the, the the Hanafis are very few and weak in Tunisia and Algeria. Even I think in Algeria they don't they don't exist anymore, and maybe they are only few in in Tunisia, but the, the main madhab there is Maliki. And in the same thing in Libya and all Africa. Yes, I'm going to speak about that later, inshallah. So, so the main book that uh, these scholars depended on is al Muatta. But there, there is another there is another main book that uh, that spread, and that was the second book of the Madhab, which is called Al Mudawana. Al Mudawana, Al Mudawana, is a book originally written by Asad ibn al Furat. Asad ibn al Furat was. Uh, went to Iraq and took from the students of Abu Hanifa rahimahullah. he came in the, in the beginning he came to Imam Malik and then he started asking him a lot of questions so Imam Malik said to him if you want these types of questions go to Iraq I don't have these types of questions so he went to Iraq and he studied with the students of Imam Abu Hanifa Muhammad Hassan and others and then when he came back to Medina he found that Imam Malik passed away so he took, he wrote, he, he went to the main, the greatest student of Imam Malik, which is Abdul Rahman ibn Qasim al Utaqi. He stayed with Imam Malik about 27 years old, nearly 30 years old. Nearly 30 years, he, re, he, he, he stayed with Imam Malik, nearly 30 years. And then he went back to Egypt and he spread his knowledge there. So Asad ibn Furat went to uh, Abdul Rahman al Qasim, and he said to him, I want you to tell me, I'm going to give you an, uh, questions of the opinions of ha the, uh, Abu Hanifa, and you tell me what Imam Malik used to say about that. So he answered his question and he compiled a book which was called Al Asadiyya. And he went to North Africa, which is now Tunisia. And there, where he uh, was a uh, used to give lectures in Al Khairawan, and he had two main classes: a class that he teaches the the Kufi between brackets, the, which is the Hanafi teachings, and a class where he teaches the Madini teachings, which is the Maliki teachings. So this Madini uh, class had a lot of students, more than the other one. 
And they used to tell him, give us from the other package that you have. They mean the Medini school. So he, one of his, the, one of the smartest students of, uh, of uh, Asad al-Mufurat was, uh, was Suhnoon, rahimahullah. Suhnoon asked Asad al-Mufurat about his book and then he went back, he went to Egypt and Imam Malik passed away before he could meet him. So he just took from the students of Imam Malik, like Asad ibn Furat, like, uh, sorry, like uh, uh, ibn, uh, ibn al-Qasim, like Abdullah ibn Wahab, like uh, Ali ibn Ziyad al-Tunusi and others. So therefore, when he took from these he went to Asad ibn Fura, uh, to uh, ibn, al, uh, ibn al Qasim and he asked him about what he answered Asad ibn Furat. So he changed a lot of his opinions. He said, Well, uh, several things I said, I think so. And now I remember that he would say so and so. So he took the book and he made a new book, which is called Al Mudawwana. And he supported it with the lots of narrations of the Prophet ﷺ by his chains and his narrations. And he added to it a lot of fatwas of Sahaba and Tabi'een and Imams, which became a big book that has 4,000 hadith of the Prophet ﷺ and has a lots of answers of a lots of questions in all Islamic law, all Islamic jurisprudence. So this book became actually the main book that Malikis depend on. And especially when he went back to uh, Tunisia and he asked uh, Ibn uh, Asad al-Mufurat to change what he, he, uh, he asked uh, Ibn al-Qasim, he, re he refused. He said, no, I don't change that because I, I took that from him directly. So then Asadiyya, people forgot about Asadiyya and they depended on Al Mudawwana. Al Mudawwana now, it's published, alhamdulillah, it's a big book, about five volumes, and it's full of knowledge. And it goes back, he, 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 he makes titles and he, he, he starts it from uh, wudu and tahara and stuff like that, and then salah, so yeah, all things. Until you go back to uh, transactions and lots of all Islamic jurisprudence. He asks uh, Ibn Qasim, and sometimes he asks Ibn Wahab and Ali ibn Ziyad al-Tunsi as well. And then he supports that with opinions of uh, Tabi'un and Aima, and he supports that with narrations that he narrated. So Hanun later on became a big, a great judge in. In, in North Africa, especially in the, the ruling of the family of uh, Aghlabis. And when the problem of, or the trail of creating the Quran, which the Mu'tazilites, when they took place and they influenced Al Khalifa, Al Ma'moon in Baghdad, he ordered all of his, uh, all of his rulers to make this to, to do the same thing in their authorities they're the the, the the lands that they rule the governors that rule north africa and so and so that were that followed the abbasis like the aglabis in north africa they started torturing sunni scholars in north africa to force them to follow this opinion so imam suhnoon stood firm and he refused he refused, and all of the students refused, and they were very strict in following Sunnah. And that led to people started loving them, and they saw that these guys are the honest people that we have to follow. So people started seeing them as, uh, as uh, real followers of Imam Malik, because they had Imam Malik in a high rank, and they saw that Imam Malik uh, says the truth, and he was tortured, but he didn't 
he didn't uh, surrender. So they saw his students like him. Uh, they followed the same way, the same path. They were strict in Sunnah, like the Imam Malik was strict in the Sunnah. And they used to uh, respect the Sunnah and respect uh, uh, the, uh, the, their teachings. And then there was a big problem that uh, uh, the Malikis faced in North Africa, which uh, where the 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 Ubaidi dynasty took place in all North Africa. They were fanatic Shia. They tortured a lot. They killed a lot. And the Malikis there stood very strong. And they even rebelled against them until they were kicked out of North Africa to Egypt. And one of the great school, all of these were the students of Imam Suhnur. And one of uh, them uh, who was uh, like them was Ibn, Ibn Abi Zayd al-Qayrawani, rahimahullah. So this led uh, to uh, compile other books, actually, which what supported the Maliki school in North Africa is more than this, is that the, the, the Umayyad dynasty in Andalusia decided to make the madhab as an official law in the whole uh, and, and all of their authorities. The same thing happened in North Africa as well, because when the Malikis kicked the Shia out of North Africa. And there was the family of Ibn Badis, al Mu'izz ibn Badis, a Berber family that took place in all North Africa, uh, Tunisia, Libya, or part of Libya, and uh, Algeria. All these, Mu'izz ibn Badis decided to make the Maliki school as an official school. And then the same thing happened in Morocco by the family, the, the, Mura, the Murabitun, which were originally from Africa, from, uh, from uh, which is called nowadays the Grand Sahara, and especially which is called nowadays Mauritania. So they were from these, uh, uh, from these people of Sahara that used to cover their faces and, you know, they wear these blue clothes and stuff like that. And they came, they took all North Africa, and they were very strict in following the Maliki school. And they spread it between the uh, Africans as well. So lots of African tribes uh, became Muslim, and they were very strict in following the Maliki teachings. So therefore, teachings spread in all South France, North Africa and Central Africa. The Madhab had some supporters in Iraq and in Syria, but they were few. But in Iraq, the Maliki school was strong sometime because lots of students of Imam Malik were there and they were great muhaddithun, usuliyun, fuqaha, like Abdul Wahab ibn Nasr al-Baghdadi, like Abu Bakr al-Abhari, like Ibn al-Qassar. They wrote very interesting books, actually. And before these, we have Imam al qarnabi Muhammad, uh, uh, Muhammad bin Muslim al qarnabi And we have others that were great scholars and wrote very interesting books. So therefore, we have now two main books, al mutwatta and al mudawwana People took care of Al-Mudawwana, but there were other books that were called Al-Ummahat. What is Al-Ummahat? That means the mother of the school. What are these Ummahat? These Ummahat actually are, we can say these are five books. Al-Muatta, Al-Wadiha, Ibn Habib, Al-Utbiya, or Al-Mustakhraja, Al-Utbi, and al Muwaziya. And the Majmu'a Ibn Abdus. So Al-Muatta, it's understood. Mudawwana, we know it. Al-Wadiha was compiled by Imam Abdul Malik Ibn Habib, who passed in the year 238. He was ordered originally from Cordoba. He didn't meet Imam Malik, but he met the great students of Imam Malik, like Ibn al-Majishon and others in Medina. So he went to Medina. 
And then he came back to Andalusia. He was a great scholar in Andalusia. And this book, he mixed hadith with uh, uh, ideas of Imam Malik and his own ideas. This book actually is a very interesting book, but so sorry to say that it's not published. We don't have it published. So actually, some say even it's, most of it is lost. We just have some papers from or some chapters of it. The third book, the third book is Al-Utbiyya or Al-Mustakharaja that was compiled by Imam Abu Abdullah uh, Muhammad ibn Ahmad ibn Abdul Aziz Al-Utbi Al-Qurtubi, even from Cordoba. He passed in the year 255. And it's fatwas of Imam Malik and It's fatwas of Imam Malik and his students, like Ibn Qasim and like others. And uh, and like you can now you can see that Andalusians took place and uh, wrote a lot of interesting books. And he even they call he he compiled a lot of what is called as samaat. What is samaat? That means what. Her, Students heard from Imam Malik or from his students, like Ibn al Qasim, like Ashab, like Ibn Nafir, like others, from Imam Malik and from, Imam Malik, uh, from them as well. So, therefore, it was a very interesting book. And this book actually, it's not published as itself, but we have a commentary on it, which is. The commentary of Imam Abu Walid ibn Rushd al Qurtubi, who was one of the great scholars of Andalusia in Cordoba, and he's the, he's the grandfather of Ibn Rushd, the philosopher that is very famous and everybody knows him. So the, uh, the fourth book is Al Mawaziyya, which was written by Muhammad ibn Al Mawaz al Iskandari from Alexandria. And, Ibn, uh, and uh, the fifth book is Al Majmu'a Libni Abdus, who was from Egypt as well. These books, we don't have them, but we have a very interesting book, which is an encyclopedia. What is this book? It's the book that was written by Al Imam Ibn Abi Zayd al Qayrawani, rahimahullah. It's called Al Nawadir wa Ziyadat. What, is, what does that mean? That means he went to all of these ummahats. He went to all of these ummahats, the main books, and he narrated them and compiled a big book in 15 or 16 volumes. And he uh, classified it in a very beautiful way and this book with Al-Mudawwana, with Al-Muatta has all the Maliki narrations so it has all the Maliki narrations if you have these three books that's it, after that you just need to understand what is there now Al-Mudawwana Now, al Mudawwana, the Malikis took care of it because it has a lots of uh, branches of al fiqh, which are more than al Mutta. And they maybe they even took care of it more than al Mutta. So, therefore, they, they went squeezing it and summarizing it. And we have a lot, several summarizings, like the summarize of Al Imam Ibn Abi Zayd Al Qayrawani. Now it's published in four volumes. And we have the summary of his student, Al Imam Abi Sa'id Al Baradi'i. This tahdib, it's called Al Tahdib Al Mudawwana, by Abi Sa'id Al Baradi'i, he's from Tunisia as well, went so far and even 
people depended on it and they made it the main book that they derived their fiqh from. So they start studying it. Why? Because it's more summarized than the Mudawwana. The Mudawwana has lots of opinions and stuff. He took the main ideas and squeezed it and took off all the narrations and stuff like that. So it became easy to study. Um, after that, after Tahdib, centuries after that, we had a book called uh, Jami' al Ummahats. Abu Amr al Hajib, which is one of the great Malikis who was in Syria, and he was the friend of Imam al Izm al Salam. And he was one of the two scholars, he and Al-Izm who were who condemned what the king of Damascus did. So they went out of Egypt, out of Syria to, to Egypt, and they were welcomed in Egypt, and they became two scholars, two great scholars of Egypt. He wrote this book, which is called Jami al Ummahat. I mean, he squeezed all the main books in one volume. And it became a very interesting book to study. So it's not only a book to read. No, it's a book to study. It became a book of studying. And then after an Imam uh, uh, Ibn al-Hajib, a, a scholar in Egypt called Khalil ibn Ishaq, he was a soldier and he was a scholar as well, a pious scholar. He went, he wrote a commentary on Jamir al-Ummahat in about 10 volumes called Al-Tawdih. And after writing this book, he made his own summary, which was squeezed and called Mukhtasaru Khalil. When Mukhtasar Khalil was, uh, people saw it, they forgot all the previous books and they stayed only studying Mukhtasar Khalil. And they wrote many commentaries on it. And until today, Mukhtasar Khalil stays the main book of the Maliki school. Yes, there was a scholar in Egypt later on called Al Imam al Dardir in the 13th uh, century, Hijri century, who went summarizing Mukhtasar Khalil and omitting a lot of things that aren't opinion, uh, important in it and wrote his own Mukhtasar, which is called Aqrab al Masarik. And he made his commentary on it, which is called al Sharh al Sagheer. And it is a famous book that people study until now, especially in Egypt and Sudan, and sometimes even in Libya and other Malikis and other places. Malikis wrote big encyclopedias. These encyclopedias are Nawadir al-Ziyadat that I mentioned by Imam Abi Zayd al-Qayrawani and we have a commentary on al-Mudawwana which is called al-Jami' Libni Yunus al-Siqalli He's from Sicily He's a great Imam past the year 451 and his book now it's published it's published in 10 volumes. This book, they call it Mus'haf al-Madhab. Mus'haf al-Madhab. That means everything you want about the Madhab, you would find it in this book. And we have the two encyclopedias that were our two commentaries on Mutta, At-Tamheed wal istidkar by Imam Ibn Abd al-Barr al-Andalusi al-Qurtubi rahimahullah. And we have the, the interest in encyclopedia on Al Mudawwana, which is a Tabsara li Abil Hassan Al Lakhmi Rahimahullah. It's very interesting. It's published now in about 10 volumes as well, past 478. In, he's originally from Tunisia. And his book is very, very sweet. Doesn't, he doesn't stay, stay, only, uh, stay on, only on the Maliki school. No, he mentions all the Madahab. And then he chooses what he, 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 he finds that is more close to the, 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 the authentic opinion. And we have Al-Bayan al-Tahseel, which is a commentary on 
المستخرجة العتبية باي الإمام الإمام أبو الوليد بن رشد رحمه الله And we have actually a lots of other books especially the commentaries on uh, on Mukhtasar Khalil and these commentaries I think that the greatest commentary and the biggest commentary is the commentary by Imam Abi Hassan Ali Ibn Rahal Al Madani, which was a great scholar from the 12th century in Morocco. In Morocco, he's originally from Bani Malal, and this commentary now it's go it's published in about 80 volumes. It's the biggest commentary on uh, Muhtasar Khalil. Now, actually, to study a madhab, it's not easy to go to these great books and study them. So therefore, scholars decided to write summarized books. Books that squeeze the information in few words. And those few words, you can study them and understand them by commentaries. So they squeezed and wrote commentaries and later on, the commentaries had some footnotes, which were called the sharh Thumma uh, sharh had taqreer, and people said, uh, and they made the hawashi. So later, the fiqh became a bit, um, it, the, the, the quality of the fiqh went down, went low. Because the previous books used to use evidence. And the evidence, they use it in a way that they discuss and they discuss other opinions and then they give you the most accepted opinion. And they use rational uh, statements. So you, you study something that is sweet, but the latest started just saying, qala fulan, qala fulan, qala fulan, and then this is the opinion, this is the most accepted opinion, this is the mashwur. So you don't find the fiqh that you need. So we went low. That's what that that what led people later on to say that the Malikis, the latest Malikis, didn't use to pay attention to the evidence at all. And that's true because the latest books later on, we don't find qala Allah, qala Rasulullah at anymore. It's it's you find just qala fulan, qala fulan, qala fulan, and then where's qala Allah, qala Rasulullah? You don't find it. And this what made a lot of scholars condemn this way of, of uh, writing books. And this is what led Imam Al-Qadi Abu Bakr al-Arabi to condemn these types of latest books. And Imam Abu Ishaq al-Shatibi as well condemned. He said these guys ruined the fiqh. And he, he, he referred that word to Imam Abu Abbas al-Qabbab al-Farsi, one of, one of the greatest Imams of Fez. He passed in the year 773. Al-Qabbab used to say that these latest, he said this, they said, he said that the latest scholars, he even mentioned their names, ruined the madhab. But even though this was a type of studying, and they start, scholars started writing small books for the beginners. So Imam Abi Zayd al-Qayrawani, for example, wrote his, his Risala. Risala, which he said, I wrote it for the children and the beginners. Well, actually, it's a very interesting book. So now, people uh, who want to study secondary studies of, of uh, Maliki studies, they start a Risala. It's not for the beginners now. But he said, I wrote it for the beginners, for the children. A Risala is not so big, not so small. And it's very clear. But Khalil is very difficult to understand. It's written in Arabic, but it's very difficult to understand. You can't just read it and understand it. No, at all. So in the latest centuries, we had a lot of scholars that wrote uh, summarized books that even don't have all of the fiqh. Some of them wrote only books that have uh, the beginning things that the, 
that you are you you have to know like Imam al akhdari for example he wrote a small book that only has an introduction moral it has morals in it and stuff like that and then it speaks about purification and then prayer and how to fix your prayer if you forgot or you did whatever the same thing for Abdul Bari, Sheikh Abdul Bari al Ashmawi in Egypt. He wrote a book like that called Al Muqaddimah al Ashmawiyah. And he speaks about purification, prayer, and fasting. And these books spread a lot, and people took care of them, started, started studying them a lot, especially. and these some of these books you can find them in this place and you don't find them in these other countries and it di differs from a place to another and schools sometimes choose this book and sometimes choose other books one of the main books that were famous and they depended on Mukhtasar Khalil is Al-Murshid Al-Mu'in al al Deen by Imam Ibn Ashir rahimahullah, who was in the 10th century Ibn Ashir wrote an introduction which contains a, a creed for the beginners and then uh, he wrote uh, uh, the five pillars of Islam so purification, prayer, fasting, uh, zakat, hajj and then he ended it with a book of tasawwuf which actually it speaks about morals and uh, and uh, teachings how to purify yourself your heart and the malikis actually took care a lot about these two things so you find in their books they write an introduction of the creed and they write uh, a chapter that speaks about morals and uh, etiquettes you can find that in a lot of books that uh, that wrote uh, in the Maliki uh, uh, the Maliki fiqh and this is in a lots of uh, lots of books now we have books okay now uh, we have books that took care of the rulings which is called al qawaid al fiqhiya this type of uh, of these types of books are very important for the mufti to have a lots of branches under his eyes like the book that was written by al-maqari al-qawaid and like a book that was written by al-wanshirisi and like the book that was write, written by imam al-qabbab and what, what was written by imam al-manjur and others others there are lots of books like that and we have books that are called an nawazil what is nawazil an nawazil is the fatwas that you have and you have to have questions about them and the the greatest book about that is what was written by imam al sharisi in the 10th century it's called the mi'yar al mu'rib wal jami' al mughrib li fatawa ulama al afriqi wal andalus wal maghrib so he wrote all the fatwas of scholars, not all the, what the, the fatwas that he had, he, he, he had from North Africa, Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco, and Andalusia. He has the fatwas of all these. It's published in about 11 volumes. In the last, in the last century, the four, we can say the 14th century, Imam Abu Isa al Mahdi al Wazani wrote what is called Al Mi'yar al Jadid. It's like a new Mi'yar. It has a lots of fatwas of Morocco, Fez, and all Morocco. And he might have derived from some fatwas out of Morocco, but normally most of them are from Morocco. It's published in about 11 volumes as well. And latest, uh, latest, a few years ago, there was a scholar in Mauritania called Yahya ibn al-Bara. 
he wrote a very huge book, very interesting book. It's Nawazil Ahli Shangit al Sahara. All the great Sahara, he went compiling their fatwas. Very interesting, very big book. So these books are very interesting because they are, they are the, how to implement the fiqh that you study. Because when you study fiqh, it's only you study it and you know it in your mind. But how is it implemented? That's why these books were written in the way that Muqtasa Khalil was written. So when you study Muqtasa Khalil, you study these nawazil to compare between the, 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 the opinions and how they are implemented. The ideas, the law, and how you can implement that law. These are called a nawazil. Kutub and Nawazil and the Malikis to care a lot about these Nawazil. We have even books of uh, uh, of uh, Tawfiq. What is Tawfiq? You know, uh, when you sell a house, when you buy, when you marry, you have to have how to write the, the, the contract between the two parts. So these books show you how to write these contracts, how to do, how to witness, etc. All these things. They're called Kutub Tawfiq. So we have a lots of branches. Fiqh actually is a very huge, uh, it's, a very, it's a very big a branch that has a lots of other branches in it. Now I'm going to end by telling you, I will end my, lec- my, uh, my lesson by telling you what is the what are the, the 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 books that normally people study in the beginning of every lecture? Now, in Azhar and Egypt and all the schools that were influenced by Egypt, like the school of Sudan, the school of Arabia, which is now, for example, in in uh, uh, the Gulf, in Ahsa, the school of Ashha, it's an old Maliki school in Ahsa. They start by Al-Ashmawiyya, and they study Al-Izziyya, and they study Aqrab al-Masalik by Dardir, and then they might end by Khalil. These four main books that they study. Well, they start with Al-Ashmawiyya normally, and Al-Izziyya, they, st- they study Al-Izziyya as well, and Aqrab al-Masalik, Dardir, and the greatest book is Khalil. Morocco and what is close to Morocco, some start with Al-Akhdari, especially the people of Mauritania and uh, uh, Algeria and uh, some other places, maybe even Africa. And some directly study, start with Al-Murshid Al-Mu'in by Ibn Ashir. And Al-Murshid Al-Mu'in by Ibn Ashir is, everybody studies it in North Africa and Africa. But Western, uh, uh, Eastern countries like Egypt and like Arabia and stuff like that and Sudan, they don't take care of Ibn Ashir a lot. Maybe nowadays they started uh, taking care of it, but in the ancient days they didn't used to take care of it. After that comes the Risala, Risala al-Abu Zayd al-Qirawani. Everybody studies Risala al-Abu Zayd al-Qirawani. And after that, the, the, the Moroccans go directly to Khalil. But they add to that two books that are interesting and important to be a, when you want to be a judge, which are Tuhfat al Ahkam, Tuhfat al Hukam, Fi al Qadaya al Ahkam by Ibn Asim al Gharnati, who was one of the great students of Imam Shatabi. He wrote a poem that shows you all what the judge needs and all what is near the judge. So the judge doesn't, doesn't deal with prayers and, fa- and fasting and all these things. He deals with marriage and contracts and selling and buying and criminals and uh, cr- crimes and stuff like that. So this poem has all these things. And it had a lot of commentaries on it. Morocco's took care of it a lot because the Malikis in North Africa implemented the law strictly in all of their courts. Andalusians and Moroccans. 
And uh, there is another book like that, which is called Lamiyat al Zakaq. It's a, it's a, it was written by an Imam al Zakaq in Fez, and it has a lots of commentaries on it as well. Of course, there are other summaries uh, that other scholars wrote, but it didn't take place like these books took place. For example, we have an Imam al uh, Imam. Uh, Abdul Qadir al Fasi, Muhammad, Muhammad Abdul Qadir al Fasi, he has a, a, a book called Al Fiqhiyya. It's similar to Ibn Ashir, but it's not a poem. It's, a, it's, a, it's written like any writings. But people didn't take care of it a lot. He used to teach it to his, to his children and his students. I think this is all what I can say. Uh, I don't want to uh, take a lot of time. And there's a lot to speak, actually, about that. Uh, there are lots of books. Uh, that can, you can uh, study in, uh, in this uh, topics or, these, uh, or the books that uh, are important in the Maliki school. And what are the books that are uh, important? What are the books that you don't have to take care of? Like uh, what Imam Ahmed ibn Abdul Aziz al-Hilali wrote in his Nur al-Basar, which is very important. And Nur al-Basar, this, what al-Hilali wrote, a Sangiti scholar called Nabigha al al Nabigha al Ghallawi, he went writing a poem called Al Butlihiya, and many uh, scholars wrote commentaries on it. So it's a poem that that speaks about Al Butlihiya, a poem that speaks about what are the books that are important in the Maliki studies. 